There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Friday Weeds. This one is indoors. The weather is cool and overcast. I don't think there's any danger of rain. But my stack of books was so t tall, uh, stuff I want to talk about today, that I just couldn't summon up the wherewithal to lug them and the tripods and this and that out into the wild. So uh, here we are indoors. Um, I'm in a great mood. I've had a great reading week. Really, my... My main personal news is I have another new blouse to debut, and this one I think is quite lovely. What do you think? I'm not going to go on and on about it, but I have to at least draw your attention to it. Came in the mail this week. Also from Old Navy, it was like $18. So yay! We're still waiting on clarification about how much of a delay there will be for Kenji's arrival. It could be anywhere from no delay, but I, don't, I think that's pretty unrealistic to... Uh, at the end of the year, if it gets beyond the end of the year, I'm going to be crushed. But if he's here for Christmas, I will be absolutely delighted. I'm still waiting for the bureaucratic people and the legal people to butt heads or put their heads together or whatever it is they need to do to sort all that out. So stay tuned. So the biggest news I have, I'm not sure that it's news. Well, it is news on my channel, is that I have finally figured out what to do with Patreon. So Patreon has gotten a major reboot in different stages and I am going to make a full video that will go on my channel and go on my Patreon to introduce Sean the Book Maniac's Patreon 2.0 but I'll just tell you about the major change that's just been voted on this week. I'm a little bit slow on the uptake and so I moved my book hauls several months ago. I moved my book hauls over onto Patreon. I thought it might lure some of you over there and it lured a few I think maybe but what I've realized is people weren't watching, not very many people were watching them or commenting on them. And as somebody, as a content provider, I need lots of comments. And my book haul videos on on my booktube channel got tons of hits and lots of comments, and it was really fun. And so I just started to wonder what's going on here, because anything that any content that I've put on, especially video content or audio content, not a lot of reaction on Patreon. And finally, and especially talking to one patron, because I taped a bite-sized book chat with her the other day, she said, and it was really valuable feedback, she said, I liked your book hauls better on YouTube because I could put them on a playlist and I could curl up on the couch and watch as many of them as I wanted with a bowl of popcorn or whatever. And on Patreon, there's no way to load up a playlist. you got to push play and you got to find them because there's no... It's, there's no no easy way to... It's just not a the most navigable um, website. So I think that and the feedback that I've gotten from patrons at other tiers is, Sean, we don't really need... We don't really want extra content from you on Patreon. We just want to support what you're doing already. And so I did another poll just to make sure. And what I've concluded is, from the results of that poll and just by my own inkling, is that... My patrons are not looking for more content, but they might enjoy more access, more socializing with me, more interaction with me. So that's the rebooted Patreon is all about everybody getting a piece of me. So starting next, you know, just a couple of weeks, we're going to have the very first book brunch once a month, monthly brunch, 60 minute chit chat on Zoom about all things bookish for any patron at any level. That's going to be the main benefit for the basic tier. And of course, everybody at the higher tiers is can take part as well. So I'm really excited. I don't know how many people will show up on a monthly basis, but let us I want to try it. And people seem much more excited about it than book hauls. So that's the short announcement about Patreon. It's going to become much more interactive and less content based. And so that also means my book hauls are coming back to BookTube. I'm excited about that. And like I say, I, as a content provider, I need, I thrive on comments and I'm getting better at answering them. I'm still not a prompt answerer, but I am getting back to my usual level of 95%, answering 95% of them. And I love getting comments. So yeah, there's win-win. The first one or two book hauls are going to be a little bit of a mishmash of stuff that I had pre-recorded that I ultimately never did post on Patreon. And so they're really cut and paste and this and that. But I could probably do, if I had the time and energy, I could probably put out four book haul videos, bang, 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 with all the books that I have 
in the pipeline that have recently come into the house. So <laughs> stay tuned for book hauls. And so when I do the weekend review, there isn't going to be, almost never is there going to be anything Patreon related because there will be very little in the way of content on Patreon from now on. So I uh, will kind of shout it out in, in other ways, including right now that I'm always happy to get more patrons to support what I'm doing here. Yeah. All right. Without further ado, here's the weekend review. Here is a book that I haven't heard anything about on BookTube, but I may not have been paying attention, but I've heard a whole heck of a lot on bookish Twitter, and that is the German novel or novella Marzan Mon Amour by Katja Oskamp, translated from the German by Joe Heinrich. It's a Pirine Press book. And I thought it was really quite affecting and well written. And now that I know more about Danuta Gleed's story and how desperately ill she was as she did her best to finish this these stories, I would be willing to judge them and experience them on a different level. I didn't know all that when I read the story yesterday and I thought it was a very fine story, but I found the introduction where they just talked about her grit, her determination, and how just terribly unwell she was at the end of her life. And the labor of love for these two Canadian writers and creative writing instructors took it on to get this book into print. It, it removes me. I, I feel like I'm for Clemp as I'm telling you about it. So yeah, this is one I'm going to read for all of those reasons. All right. I have a bail to talk to you about. I have three books that I finished, but only one of which I'm at liberty to talk about at this moment. Others are for other collaborations, so you'll just have to wait a few more days. And I think I have four, maybe five books that I, I'm well enough into to check in. And that, that will be the meat of this Friday Reads is the books that I'm checking in on midstream. If you missed that Friday Reads, I have tweaked my Friday Reads. I no longer necessarily talk about the books that I told you last week that I was going to be starting because inevitably I've only read 10 pages of them and it's just not enough to check in on. And so now that part of my Friday Reads is about books that I'm at least 40 to 50 pages into that I have something to say about. So that's now the middle chunk of the Friday Reads. I bailed on this Maori novel, The Imaginary Lives of James Ponicky by Tina Macaretti. I talked last week about the fact that it was the diction, was the uh, antiquated diction probably was authentic for how a British educated Maori kid would speak English in the, whenever this was, the late 19th century or something. But I didn't like it. I didn't respond to it. It kept me a little bit distant from the story, but much more fatally, the character development was almost non-existent. These characters did not come alive for me, so it was an important story that was told badly because the characters were so paper thin. So this was supposed to be the focus of a discussion that's being taped tomorrow <laughs> on the Bookcast Club, but I was invited as a guest and I gave them a short list of five books I'd be interested in reading, and this is the one that was chosen, and then we didn't like it. So we're going to do something else. I'll keep you in suspense about what we're doing instead, but we're not talking about this because it didn't warrant our time and energy. Of the three that I finished, I can talk for a few minutes about this one, Christy Mollery's own double entry by B.S. Johnson. It was his last novel, or maybe penultimate novel. He committed suicide at the age of 40 in 1973. This was a buddy read with Joe Smith, and we enjoyed it. I think Joe liked it a bit better than I did. I give it four stars. In other words, it was the kind of book that, if I hadn't been doing it as a buddy read, would I have finished it? I don't know. No, I, I enjoyed it, but it had no emotional <laughs> um, impact on me, or I didn't get invested in the story on that level. But it was amusing and clever, and there was humor that maybe went over my head that Joe appreciated more deeply, because she's a Brit. But it was f funny, and I talked about it, I think, just last week. I was glad that it was only 180 pages. I'm glad I read it. If you like lightly metafictional, avant-garde, postmodern literature and British humor is your game and you're a lefty, you probably appreciate it more than I did, although I'm s many of those things in certain proportions. B.S. Johnson sounds like an interesting man. He wrote a whole bunch of novels. He made films, I think essays, and I've forgotten there was a few other things he did in his short life. I'm not sure I would read anything else by him, but this was fun to try. 
Uh, as I said last week, the premise is the titular protagonist is an accountant and he feels hard done by by the world and so he starts using the double entry system that if something is perpetrated upon him he must seek his revenge in some way so it's kind of a, a comical pomo revenge story not boring it's gonna kill me not to talk about this but i'm doing a pseudo buddy read zoom chat with nemeka from nigeria about this debut novel on sunday and i hope to have it for you edited and posted within a, a week or two. This debut queer Nigerian novel, and then he sang a lullaby. I just went back to listen to the recording that Nemeka kindly sent me through Instagram to get the author's pronunciation. Annie Kayode Sam Tochuku. I, I just dying to t- tell you all about it, but just wait a few more days. And if the gleam in my eye is a spoiler, so be it. I have also finished this novella called The Snow Goose, by Paul Gallico that I'm reading in preparation for part two of the novella colloquy that I'm having with the Calgary novelist Barb Howard. And I'm not going to say anything about it either. And looking forward to chatting about all the novellas that Barb and I were are going to be reading. I'm going to reread some of the ones I suggested to Barb. I'm going to read two or maybe even all three of the ones she recommended to me. And this was one of them. Stay tuned for that. That won't be for a month or two. So now I'm going to check on, on four novels that I'm 40 to 50 pages into. Give you a preliminary report, but not based on 10 pages, but at least 40 or 50 pages. First one is this Czech novel. Mendelssohn is on the Roof by Jury Vile, translated from the Czech by Marie Wynne. And I am really, really enjoying this. I've read the first four chapters up to page 49. This is set during the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia. An SS officer is ordered to remove the statue of the Jewish composer. I'm I'm not sure that I have kept that factoid in my head that Mendelssohn was Jewish, but he was. And the Nazi powers that be ordered a statue of him removed from the roof of a certain theater or something. The stupid Nazi soldiers get up there and there's no names on any of these statues, so they don't know which one's Mendelssohn, and so then they have to go and get help from Jewish scholars that they are have all rounded up and barricaded in a small little area of Prague. So it's, you can tell it's a darkly comic novel. It's really historically accurate because I've been checking everything. The head Nazi honcho jerk is not only a real figure, but he was really one of the architects of the Holocaust. Heydrich. There's a lot about him in both of the books by Dasa Durndich that I've read. He was one of the worst of the worst of the Nazis in terms of his role in implementing the Holocaust. And he is, at this stage of his career, the the top dog in Prague. There's another character in chapter three, Rudolf, and he's a doctor in the current timeline, 1940s. He's wasting away in hospital in Prague of a rare disease that sounds quite a bit like Lou Gehrig's disease, but I don't know if that's what it is. So he's just becoming more and more paralyzed and immobile, but has all of his faculties. And then the earlier timeline is he and another guy taking a long trip along the rivers. And I don't know what it's all about, and I don't know how he is connected to the other story, but I'm assuming he's going to be a major character. And one of his concerns, as he is immobilized and probably not long for this world in this hospital, is that he is responsible for the care of a young niece and nephew whose parents were killed, and they may have been Jews murdered by the Nazis. That part isn't clear to me yet, but he's responsible for them, and he's not going to be around much longer, and what is he going to do? And I think all of that is going to get threaded through the other part of the story, and I'm just absolutely fascinated. This is totally gripping. It had been sitting on my shelf for years, and I'm so glad that because of War on Booktube that I have finally gotten to it. Jury Vile, born in 1900 in Prague, one of the best-known writers in Central Europe in the, in the 30s and then in the post-war years. In 1942, he escaped transportation to the death camps by faking his own death. I think the next thing I want to read is not another book by him, but a book about him. Holy smokes. I am now a ways into 
to the debut novel, No Bones, by Anna Burns. Of course, she's the author of Milkman. I have read 50 pages of this. And it's, no, it's not nearly as good as Milkman. And the style is very different, but it's good. I'm engaged by it and fascinated to go back to the beginning of her oeuvre to see how her style has developed. Because the style in Milkman, the style and the tone were so incredibly unique. There's nothing unique about the way the story is written, but I see little buds, little prose buds and little uh, storytelling buds that I can see that totally blossomed to create this masterpiece that was Milkman. But this is really good. So it's set during the time of Troubles, and one of the main characters is a little Irish girl, a little Catholic Irish girl, Amelia. The opening chapter in 1969 is when a bunch of Protestant militants are trying to break into their house in the middle of the night, and they're all cowering, and the windows are all boarded up. It's, it's really harrowing. And then a cousin, an Irish cousin whose family moved to London years before. He's a British soldier, and he's stationed in Belfast. This is set in Belfast. And he looks up his old aunt and uncles, and that's her parents. And the first visit in 1969 is friendly, but so I don't know the month by month, year by year progression of the troubles, but it was not problematic for him to look up his relatives who he'd never met, or maybe they'd... No, he'd never met them. He was born in London, but his parents were Irish. And they welcomed him. But then when he comes back a couple of years later, not so welcoming, and a whole bunch of terrible stuff has happened. I think that's all I'm going to say about it. It is definitely worth your time. Based on the first 50 pages, I'd say it's not of the caliber of Milkman, but it's, I'm invested, I'm uh, engaged. I'm now eight chapters into this novel by a Nigerian Saskatoon writer. Michael Affenfia's Leave My Bones in Saskatoon. I went to the launch, I talked about it. It was the most colorful, fascinating book launch I've ever been to in my life, and I've been to hundreds. And now I'm finally reading the novel that he signed, and I'm going to have him on my channel when I finish reading it. So I'm not going to say too much now. It's engaging. It's a very unusual storytelling and prose style that's taking me some getting used to, because this is still back in Nigeria, these first several chapters. Soon enough, the characters are going to get to Saskatoon, and I am just so deathly curious to see how Saskatoon is represented through Nigerian immigrant eyes. I think that's all I want to say. I'm, I'm not, you're, I will never probably wrap this up other than in the conversation that I'm very much hoping to have with Michael Affenfia. Michael Affenfia has published at least two other novels, I think more, that have been published in Nigeria. And he's such an interesting person and has such an interesting perspective on life, Canadian life, immigrant life, and Nigeria from the book launch. There was an on-stage interview and I just really warmed to him and I'm certainly engaged by this novel. Enough said, stay tuned. And finally, the last book that I want to check in on, the first 38 pages have been a delightful surprise and that is The Sex Life of My Aunt by Mavis Cheek. I expected that this was going to be maybe a bail or just a book that I would, wouldn't really care about because it's got like a 3.67 or something rating on Goodreads, but you know, I shouldn't rely as much on that. I was delighted by the first uh, two chapters, 38 pages. Our protagonist, I think her name is Dillis. It's a first-person narrative. I believe her name is Dillis. She came from a lower-class family, married a lawyer that she wasn't very attracted to, but she thought was very kind. And so they've had kind of a passion-free, companionate marriage. And she has a wonderfully acerbic sense of humor that is also emotionally vulnerable so I am already completely invested in this story and I haven't met the ant yet that's in the very next chapter the chapter three is entitled cocktails with my aunt so don't know anything about the ant yet but who I've met are Dillis if that's her name her husband Francis her sister and they have a totally rivalrous conflict ridden relationship these two sisters her best friend died not suddenly but young, age 50 or something, and or maybe even 40. 
So it was a long, painful death. And coming home from her funeral, in tears at the train station, a man offers her a handkerchief, and they start up a conversation, and Dillis is aroused by him. That's all that's happened. She comes home. Her f husband would have gone to the funeral, but he was sick in bed with flu. And there's this wonderful scene where she comes home and she's grief-stricken. She's aroused by this little conversation because they took the train home together and nothing happened, just conversation. But she was so attracted to this guy and she knows that this is because she's totally grief-stricken and it's much more pleasant to focus on an attractive stranger than it is the fact that she's lost her best friend. And she goes home and her husband is sick and he's got ointment all over his body that's stinking up the bedroom and he's so sick he doesn't really ask her how the funeral was and she's really grumpy and still thinking about this guy. And that scene was just a joy to read. There's just a comical competence about the way this story is told that is just delighting the pants off me, Mavis Cheek. That's a happy surprise, at least so far. All right, so that's what I'm checking in on, and now I'm going to show you... I say this every week. It's really boring for me to say it every week, but I'm out of control, and here are books I'm going to be starting, both for Women in Translation Month and otherwise. Joe Smith and I are buddy reading this collection of short stories, Breast Stories, by Mahaswata Devi, translated from Bengali by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. There's only three stories and three... Essays or Introductions by Spivak, who is not my favorite person to read. I told, I mentioned, I think, in my TBR video that I went to a lecture she gave in Saskatoon. She's a preeminent post-colonial theorist. Well, it's the theorist part. I, I can't... She's unintelligible to me, the level of academic jargon that she writes in. She's a brilliant person, and what I really respect about her is that she... She's got, she does all this theorizing, which I can't make head or tail of. But she's also committed to working for the social justice causes by doing things like typing, secretarial work for these organizations. Like, she's, she's in at all those levels, and I really respect that. But I'm not a big fan of her prose, so I think Joe and I are just going to go directly to the stories and only read her introduction or translator's foreword, and there's another essay if we feel we have to, to to get to the stories. But Joe has read Mahaswata Devi before and liked her. I haven't, so I'm very curious. If you saw my library book vlog the other day, this is one of the books that came to the top of the pile based on those tri-chapter type explorations. So I'm going to keep on reading this, and I'm probably take me the rest of the year to read it. Selected short stories of Liam O'Flaherty, a really famous Irish writer I'd never heard of. Loved the first two very, very short stories, as I talk about in the vlog, so I'm going to keep going with them. The Mooks and the Gripes podcast, their episode on Natalia Ginsburg's novella, The Dry Heart, has just gone live, like yesterday, I think. So I'm going to read it, maybe even try to finish it this weekend. Certainly have it finished or bailed upon, because I'm not a big Natalia Ginsburg fan, but this time next week. And can I just vent again about how much I hate things libraries do? Look at that label. There's the spine label, right on the title. Ugh, oh, that just drives me nuts. I couldn't stand Natalia Ginsburg's family lexicon and bailed. I remember... I can even remember which park in Tokyo I was sitting in when I told you how much I hated that book few years ago. And this one, I hope, goes better, but I don't have high hopes. So it'd be nice to be pleasantly surprised, don't you think? Oh, and I should say translated from the Italian by Francis Frenet. Because it's the longest book on my Women in Translation TBR, I have to get started on this one. And this is the Quebec novel The Tin Flute by Gabriel Roy, translated from the French by Alan Brown. After I read the first page on my Patreon book haul, and then I gave you that full excerpt on the Week in Review, I think just last week. I can't put this off any longer. I have to get to Ellen Hawley's latest novel, A Decent World. I think I've talked about it uh, quite a bit in recent videos, so I'll just that's all I'm going to say. I'm stoked. And finally, my dear friend Gwen here in Saskatoon 
this is quite a story. We're going to be ha having a pseudo buddy read, although she doesn't come on camera, unfortunately, because she would be so wonderful as a interlocutor, as a participant in various things. She's very bookish. She's brilliant and fun and funny, but she is one of my friends who just absolutely would never consider coming on video. So you'll just have to take my word for it. She was in New Zealand and... I ordered this book when she was there, and it cost me like an arm and a leg to get it shipped from New Zealand. And I thought, about a week later, why the hell didn't you ask Gwen to pick it up for you? <laughs> you could have saved all that shipping. But I did send her a message to say, I'm such an idiot, blah, blah, blah. But it's a novel I think you might be interested in. If you are, here's the Goodreads link. Pick up your own copy and we'll, we'll buddy read it when you get back. So she did. And that is this fairly recent New Zealand novel, Loop Tracks by Sue Orr. I have a bite-sized book chat about it. I'll put a link t to that. And it's got lots of issues in it, abortion and so on. She and I will be discussing it at the end of the month. And yeah, it's not easily available. I think I paid about $30, maybe even $30 US for shipping. Like, I think it was four, fifty or $60 to get the book into my hands. I hope it will have been worth it. All right, that's what I got for this week. What have you got for me? I would love to hear from you in the comments section. In fact, I would love to hear about the last book that you read or are currently reading that you think I would like. Thanks for watching.